afternoon. It is so good to see all of you, and it's just really emotional after so many years of, we, we promised you a big party for the anniversary, and um, we're so thrilled to be able to have everybody together. On behalf of the Ali Board of Advisors and Vice Provost Yakut Ghazi, I want to thank you for coming. We are honored by your presence. My name is Chris McLeod, and I've had the privilege of serving as OLLI Director for the last five years. Today we gather... <laughs> My anniversary is actually uh, June 30th. Today we gather to celebrate 45 years of lifelong learning at Duke. Now that's no small feat given Duke's getting ready to celebrate its centennial next year in 2024. We are grateful for the opportunity to be here in person in this beautiful space to celebrate and give thanks for the OLLI community and what it has meant and continues to mean to each one of you. We are fortunate to have all three of the OLLI founders with us today. Jean Obar, who was Director of Continuing Education at the time the Duke Institute for Learning and Retirement was established, along with Judith Ruderman, who was then Vice Provost, and Sarah Craven, our longest serving OLLI Director of 20 years, I'll note. We also appreciate that um, OLLI Director Gary Kreitz, my predecessor, has joined us today. To properly celebrate our 45th anniversary and all that OLLI has become, it's important to recognize the role of our volunteers. Those are the ones who helped OLLI at Duke grow into the nationally recognized program it is today. Thanks to their efforts, we are known for our robust curriculum, our outstanding instructors, and leadership in diversity, equity, and inclusion. We would be remiss if we also didn't take the opportunity to invite our guests to join OLLI, in person or online. We want you to know what many of us knew before COVID, and that is OLLI is truly life-saving. Now, I recognize that's a bold statement to make, given that we are an institution that is world-renowned for its life-saving health care and groundbreaking medical research. But let me explain. We spend the better part of our lives as members of distinct communities of belonging. We are members of schools, neighborhoods, churches and synagogues, and even our workplace. These are the places where we often find meaning, make friends, and even derive a sense of identity. But many of us know retirement is a time of transition. When we retire, everything changes. And if we are not intentional about this chapter, we can find ourselves socially isolated, lonely, and lacking a sense of meaning and purpose. Research studies have found that loneliness is just as lethal as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. People who are lonely are 50% more likely to die prematurely than those with healthy social relationships. Now there's several reasons why loneliness can be deadly. First, it reduces your immunity, which can increase your risk of disease. But it also increases inflammation in the body which can contribute to your risks for heart disease, stroke, and other chronic health conditions. At a recent instructor coffee, one of, my, one of our instructors, who's a retired physician, said to me, Ollie saved my life. This was someone whose life was completely absorbed by work, working 60, 70 hours a week until he retired. Now he's teaching classes on the life and legacy of Oliver Sacks and all things neuroscience. In a recent editorial in the New York Times, U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy shared his own journey and experience of loneliness after retiring from his first term during the Obama administration. 
Later, in a follow-up article, Murti recommended some fairly straightforward strategies to alleviate social isolation and loneliness, most of which can be accomplished simply by joining Ali. <laughs> Not only is Ali an affordable antidote to social isolation and loneliness, it is a prescription for thriving in the third chapter. Many of you already know that. We have an entire generation of members who were business majors or pre-med who are now discovering the power of poetry and literature in intimate classes of eight to 10 members. Others are embracing this time to reflect and writing a memoir or a legacy letter for their families. Our Tai Chi and Vivo strength classes are inspiring many of our members to begin exercising for the first time. Ali is a community where both members and instructors rebuild, reinvent, rediscover, and reimagine their lives. What's been most exciting to me about the COVID years, as we affectionately call them, is how we've been able to extend Ali's reach and magnify our impact through our online courses. For the first two years of Ali's his 42 years of Ali's history, we were only able to serve those who were able to get in their car and drive to one of our 23 classroom locations. Today, thanks to the catalyst of COVID, our online courses allow us to reach an even broader demographic of older adults. Those who are unable to drive, recovering from surgery or have difficulty with hearing or mobility challenges are able to join our online courses. Our online courses are also a lifeline for those who are caregiving and their loved ones. For those of you who recently moved to the Triangle, Ollie's in-person classes provide opportunities to meet and make new friends. Today, our reach is truly global. While the majority of our members still live in North Carolina, over the past year, we've had Duke alumni join us from LA, Paris, Tel Aviv, Hong Kong, Cedar Rapids, and Chicago, to name a few. <laughs> so we hope you'll join us this fall. Before I introduce Dr. Ghazi, I want to just take a moment to recognize and thank Ali's staff, who I have the honor of working with every day. I'm continually inspired by their commitment and their consistently high level of professionalism. And I really do appreciate all your feedback. Um, most of you know we're a high feedback culture. Um, and so I want you to know I get it from my staff as much as I do from you. And we always consider it lifelong learning. I also want to express my appreciation to the members of the 45th Anniversary Task Force and Ollie's Board of Advisors for all they've done to make today possible. I'm grateful to have you as colleagues in this work. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Yakut Ghazi, the inaugural Vice Provost of Duke Learning Innovation and Digital Education. Yakut arrived in August from Georgia Tech and impressed all of us by how quickly she connected and understood our challenges and opportunities. We are excited and inspired by her vision, her leadership, and the team she is assembling to put Duke on the map as a powerhouse for lifetime education and learning innovation. For the past 30 years, Yakut held leadership roles at universities in four countries. But perhaps even more importantly, at least as far as I'm concerned, is that she is warm, kind, accessible, and willing to listen, even when you disagree. <laughs> when she first accepted the role and shared news of her Duke appointment on LinkedIn, I watched as she received so many notes and well wishes from her peers and colleagues across the globe. It was immediately obvious to me that not only was she deeply respected, she was truly beloved. And my early impressions were further validated when I attended a conference in Washington DC a few months ago on, on online education. Upon learning I worked at Duke, at least five people said some version of Wow, you are so lucky to work with Yakut. And indeed we are. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yakut Ghazi.
Now I'm going to open my mouth and, you know, not validate everything that you said about me. So, oh, I mean, thank you so much, Chris. What a, I don't know, I'm, I'm humbled, so um, I'm shaken. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the 45th year celebration of Ali. And I also would like to welcome about 300 attendees who are joining us virtually this afternoon. Um, I want to begin by echoing Chris and expressing my deep gratitude for Ali volunteers um, for the years of devotion to making our Duke program among the largest in the country. There are about, I think, 124, 25 Ollies across the country. And from our, our beginning in 1977, these volunteers and also the staff of Ali, and in the last five years, Chris, um, have been critical to our success. So please help me thank Chris for your passion, for your work, and for your leadership, Chris. And may I also ask those of you who are either Ali staff or volunteer, to, if you're able to stand up, and if you're online helping the online group, um, raise your hand so we can, we can recognize you and appreciate your work. You can raise your hand, get up. Thank you very much. You will see me going through pages but it's not really long, it's just large print. So, <laughs> you know it, right? So my goal and my team's goal to transform Duke into a powerhouse for lifetime education and learning innovation rests on delivering affordable and accessible programs um, and create um, access to high quality higher education. Um, which proved to be a challenge for many higher education institutions because of traditional approaches to education that are really tied to quotas and um, you know, capacity problems and so on and so forth. So, um, and you all know, you see it in the media and in you know, politicians' speeches that that higher education leaves many people behind and it doesn't really connect to the needs of many higher education learners here um, that, um, during this time of the um, human evolution. So um, our organization is here to serve learners pre-K through gray and pre-college to post-career. And Ali is a nice portion of that continuum that I have the opportunity to oversee with the pre-college programs, undergraduate summer um, sem semester, as well as uh, career upskilling up and reskilling programs, and then post-career programs. Um, we use the power of digital education to serve our learners through programs and services. When I say digital education, I don't say online. Digital education is a continuum from 1% to 100%. The most interesting problem right now for us educators is, is the intelligent combination of in-person and online. When does it matter? When does it, reach, uh, when does it help us reach learner goals and learner satisfaction in an, in an intelligent way? So, Ali's operation is really essential for our uh, mission to serve learners. And um, we also recognize that not all universities have a powerful division like Ali. So uh, we recognize it's a unique advantage and in many ways an untapped potential. So um, I truly am excited to be a part of an organization where there is Ali. And it's first in my career I haven't been to a place where there was this opportunity. But with your permission, let me disclose some of my uh, philosophical convictions that guide my work as an administrator and also a scholar in the field. I believe, given the time and opportunity, um, given the time and opportunity to learn, all learners can, almost all learners can learn a, at A and B levels. And these levels are usually 15 to 20% of traditional population, right? So if we give enough time and motivation and opportunity, most uh, learners can learn at those levels. At institutions like Duke, we turn away very capable students who could achieve our rigor, who could achieve what we expect from them, not only because there's lack of talent, it's because capacity problems, right? Capacities and quotas that higher education traditionally has. And uh, digital learning is not only an innovative tool that can address practical problems like these, capacity problems, or problems that we face during COVID, like you mentioned, Chris, 
but digital education is the most centric, student-centric uh, approach to education because you start with the learning goals and then you devise education from that. And I know it's not what you experienced during COVID, but the real digital education, online education really focuses on learners. So um, digital education is powerful. Now, this one is a little controversial, but I really truly believe in my heart and in my gut that the world needs more people with Harvard, Stanford, Oxford, Duke type education. The world needs Harvard, Stanford, Duke and Oxford to touch more lives. And this kind of high quality education must not always have to be in person. And the challenges that we have, the challenges of the future of work, the challenges of education are indeed issues of scale and inclusion. And those problems need, um, we need to attack those problems with a mindset of scale and inclusion. Um, time is up for boutique solutions. Um, this is another controversial one, but um, it really guides our work. We at Duke have the power to create solutions at scale. And if I may say, we have the responsibility to create, to create those solutions at scale. So the hope for my uh, organization for learning innovation and digital education is that we can bring our expertise in many areas of education uh, and use intelligent, intelligent technologies to reach more lives. We can meet more learners where they are and we can lower barriers to access and opportunity. But what does this mean for Ali? Um, with a large portfolio of programs and services powered by digital education, we are an organization um, that is that can be the educational partner of choice for many learners pre-K through gray, um, pre-college to post-career. And post-career, that's the traditional Ali learners, right? The traditional Ali learners. But with longer life and longer careers, we actually need more of the career programs in Ali portfolio as well, right? We will need to learn more career skills. I know I'm going to have to work toward, you know, way into my 70s. Um, I have a 14-year-old daughter, so I know she's going to go to college and whatnot, right? So, but I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? Ali is not just about academic enrichment anymore. Ali is also about career programs and, and upskilling and reskilling. So with the large portfolio that we have right now with, under our organization, we can actually broaden the portfolio offerings of Ali. And, you know, if you look at the current portfolio of Ali, it's a beautiful extension of Duke's power as, um, you know, humanities and social sciences and arts institution, right? It is a beautiful extension that, um, of our current offerings. Um, so we will also need to continue, all of us, we will need to continue to transform ourselves through these programs and services and transform our communities as parents, as aunts and uncles, as grandparents, friends, neighbors, and allies. It's such a critical time in our um, society, as well as global societies, while we're grappling with issues of uh, racial equity and justice, women's rights, human rights, fundamental freedoms, poverty, and most of all, the future of our planet. So our goal is to have portfolio and services across the lifelong continuum to address these issues and help us transform our societies. So it is my goal to see Ali at Duke to continue to modernize and thrive for another 45 years, expanding our impact um, to larger groups of people with your partnership, through building lifetime engagements with uh, learners through intelligent programming and services, powered by digital education, we will put Duke on the map as a powerhouse for innovative education for a lifetime. And when we get together in five years, hopefully we will share some success stories with you. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Heather Whitson, the director of Duke Aging Center. We invited Dr. Whitson to introduce our speaker today because the Center for the Study of Aging and Human Development, now known as the Duke Aging Center, played an important role in the establishment of Ali. Dr. Whitson is an internist, geriatrician, and professor of medicine. The overriding goal of her research efforts is to optimize independence and resilience in people with multiple chronic conditions. She also has a particular expertise related to how the aging process affects the brain. 
Through her several institutional and national leadership roles, Dr. Whitson coordinates and facilitates efforts to improve knowledge and care decisions for medically complex older patients. Important work that will ultimately impact, impact the care we will all receive. Please welcome the delightful Dr. Heather Whitson. Thank you. Well, good afternoon and happy birthday to Ollie. Um, happy 45th birthday. I'm glad to see that it's made it to a healthy middle age. And as Dr. Ghazi just said, it's shooting for elderhood. So um, <laughs> I, I hope to be here to, to see that. Um, so I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge what was just mentioned about this rich history between the Duke Aging Center, which I direct, um, and the Ollie program. Um, so for those of you who may not know, and I heard that, um, that this was just discovered when um, Gino Barr was interviewing um, uh, Marion, or maybe Marion was interviewing Gino Barr um, about this 45th anniversary and, and discovered that um, a renowned gerontologist, um, uh, Dr. George Maddox, who was one of the founding fathers of the Duke Aging Center, uh, one of the many things that he is remembered for um, is that he was really instrumental in creating what was called at the time the Duke Institute for Learning and Retirement. Um, but as I understand it, conversations and shared vision knowing Dr. Maddox likely over wine, um, occurred between Gene and, Obar and uh, Gene Obar and George. Um, and that really played the critical role in establishing what is now OLLI um, and its success and growth over these past years. So I'm really honored to be here today as sort of um, a part of that legacy. Um, and I'm also very honored to be able to introduce someone who uh, I feel is uh, an incredible role model, and I'm also really honored to call her a colleague and friend. Um, so Dr. Louise Aronson um, is one of those people who I always think of as a boundary defier. I think that she's the sort of person who sees what lots of us see. There are problems with this healthcare system, and there are problems with, with our approaches in Western medicine to taking care of, of aging people. But instead of stopping at that observation, she asks the question, how could we do it better? What are we doing right? What could I do about being part of the solution? So first, I just want to acknowledge that you would be hard-pressed in this country to find a more accomplished academic clinician. Dr. Aronson is professor of medicine at UC San Francisco. She's a graduate of Brown University and Harvard Medical School. In our field, she's universally regarded as a doctor who exemplifies the principles that we hold dear in geriatrics medicine of patient-centered, priority-driven care, making decisions every day for some of the most medically complex patients um, in our care system. Her genius as a clinician has been recognized with the gold professorship in humanism and medicine the California Home Care Physician of the Year Award, and the American Geri Geriatric Society Clinician Teacher of the Year Award. And that's plenty. Many CVs could just stop there, <laughs> and you'd feel that you were in the presence of greatness. But dominating the field of geriatric medicine was not enough for a boundary breaker. So as I said, um, uh, you would also be hard-pressed to find a more accomplished author. So she holds an MFA from the Warren Wilson Program for Writers, her book, Elderhood, Redefining Aging, Transforming Medicine, and Reimagining Life, is not only a bestseller, but it's a Pulitzer Prize finalist. And that's really not too shabby when this is somebody who kind of has another important day job. <laughs> um, and I would say her boundaries don't even stop at being a geriatrician and a writer. She's also a tireless advocate in our field for aging issues, and she's a warrior for anti-ageism. So she teaches and models this, through extensive leadership roles in education. She's an innovator who has designed and leads clinical programs and projects that are aimed at improving the lives of patients around her. She serves as a consultant on aging issues for the state of California and has recently served on task forces or advised ranging from memory care to assisted living to the COVID-19 response. So I've had the privilege of watching her firsthand in her roles as educator and also um, having been a co-author and there is not another like her. So I think despite her vast accomplishments, what you're about to see is that she also walks across this earth with a sense of curiosity and a sense of humor and humility that are just rare to find in any people, let alone one with this list of accomplishments. So it's my real pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Aronson.
Well, that was quite the introduction. Um, I don't know how I'm going to live up to that, but thank you, Heather. Um, I feel pretty much the same way about you, so we could just have a mutual admiration moment, but probably I should get to the task at hand. Um, thank you all for coming. This is a, a great crowd. Um, and I'm going to try to cover a whole lot of things about aging, ageism, and the future of old age in 35, 40 minutes. So we should probably get started. Um, I have a tendency to see what's wrong with things, but I want to move us through where the challenges are to where the opportunities are for us as individuals and as a society. Um, this is the history of human aging. Yeah, so, you know, we're not that good at this, but, but we kind of come by it honestly. It's a fairly recent thing, this growing very, very old. And while you can argue people actually started writing, you know, the, the horror, the warnings over a century ago, um, you know, and then again 50 years ago, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so far, lots of bad things have happened, but I don't think most of them have anything to do with growing old. So. Let's move on. Um, does age matter? It does. This is one of the early curves of COVID-19 deaths. But what I want you to notice here is that it looks like, oh, you get old and then you're really vulnerable. A huge percentage of this had to do with policies and social attitudes. And that's actually good news, because we can change those in a way that it's hard to change biology. Hopefully, I'll convince you of that by the end. Um, but age isn't everything. So for those of you who don't like graphs and data, don't worry. You can just listen to me. You don't have to pay attention. But those who like may want to have a look. Um, so this is mortality differences among people who were 75 to 84 years old, so old people. And what we saw was the risk for death from COVID-19 in the first year of the pandemic was the rate difference was nearly 900 if you were black, right? 500 if you were Latinx, you know, and on down, right? That's not biology. That's policies and social priorities. So there's all these ways in which we make lives harder. And the question is, could we use those same tools to make lives better? Um, this is a guy who's actually emeritus now at Stanford, John Chauvin. He's an economist. And he, he looked at aging a little differently than other people, whereas some people sort of look at age charts. He looked at what would happen if we categorized where you were in life based on your chance of death. And when he did it that way, he said if you were middle-aged, you had a 1% chance. If you were, I better do this right, if you were old, you had a 2%. And if you were elderly, you had a 4% chance of death over the next year. And what he found was, it's not just that we're getting older, it's that when we experience these stages is shifting to older ages too. And that has huge implications for how we live and how we age, when we might want to get educated or retrained, all the things we can do with our extra decades of life. On the other hand, this is the United States in orange, right? Comparable countries, people are living longer and longer, but here it's plummeting. And it's plummeting partly because of racial differences. It's, part, it's plummeting partly because of um, opioid epidemic and, and differences in, in people's access to health and health care in this country. That, too, is something we could do something about. <laughs> this, I'm sorry to say, is the curve of your chance of dying. Um, <laughs> It kind of goes up to infinity. Human mortality is holding steady at 100%. Now, the good news is that <laughs> if you're going to do it, you want to do it way over there on that side of the curve, right? Um, so, so there are some risks. Um, but there are also opportunities. Um, now, you know, this is a whole other conversation that we can have right at this moment. <laughs> And I'm not going to touch that. Um, but we will notice that everyone um, up there with those opportunities is white. And that's not a coincidence. That ties into everything else we're talking about today. OK, so now I'm actually going to start talking about aging. I think you thought I was talking about aging. But now we're going to get into aging um, more seriously. And I'm going to talk about it alternating between um, society and then healthcare. Healthcare, I think, is, is a way of showing an example of how the things we see in society um, influence a particular industry. 
It's convenient for me because I happen to know it and work in it. And it's apropos because as we get older, we require more health care. Now, that's usually considered a bad thing, right? Older people are using so many health care dollars. But let me ask you, when was the last time you heard somebody say, it's outrageous what percent of the education budget is taken up by children, <laughs> right? So we blame old people for their needs in ways we don't blame younger people for theirs. OK, when we talk about old age, there are a variety of approaches. One of it is eat your kale and blueberries, and you don't have to grow old. Now, you might be healthier, but you still have to grow old. Um, there's the exceptional elder, <laughs> right? <laughs> Guys, you feeling like that? Yeah. And then there's this, which like orthopedic surgery definitely required after. I, can, I don't think I could do that when I was eight. So you look at these things, and yeah, they're amazing. We say, that's an amazing older person. But you also think, that's not me. I can't do that. I'm not going to try to do that. That's absurd, right? So it's actually not a helpful way of talking about old age. And then there's the best one of all the silver tsunami, because what's the upside to a tsunami? Yeah, there isn't one, right? <laughs> so there's no upside to a tsunami. It destroys everything. And, and luckily, in this particular picture, there, there are other things to note. One is that all old people are the same. They're gray, because of course, that's true, right? What? Anyway, and then they're destroying children. When in fact, we know that healthier older people lead to healthier children and vice versa. You don't have a highly functional society by pitting parts against each other. Um, so, so we tell these stories of old age, and it makes it seem kind of awful and something you want to stay away from by eating your kale and blueberries um, and by not being part of the silver tsunami. And so we end up with medical education, where I'm, I'm just going to uh, you know, pick on my own people. So in medical school, it's a four-year process. Generally, you get several months of education about children. And these days, you get a couple of weeks of education about old people at many places. And that is like a 20-fold increase from my day. Um, and then the whole rest, years, are devoted to adults, even though a child walking down the street can tell the difference between an 8-year-old, a 48-year-old, and a 78-year-old. They are different socially, medically, physiologically, immunologically. But we don't give them the same attention. And actually, I was at an event with a leader of the uh, uh, Association of American Medical Colleges last month. And he said, well, yeah, but there are all these interest groups. They're the people who want to talk about opiates. And they're the people who want to talk about international health. And they don't see an issue of parity here, where if we're talking about kids and we're talking about adults, then we need to talk about older adults. Or the fact that it pertains to everyone. And that when we talk about a heart, why don't we talk about a heart when it's newly born? and a heart when it's a teenager, and a heart when it's in its 30s, and a heart when it's in its 80s. It, it's not hard to imagine how you could do this and the better care that would happen as a result. Well, we don't look at that COVID curve and think that's because old people are frail. We look at that COVID curve and we think that's because people aren't trained to take care of those people. <laughs> I kind of love these. A lot of them you know, have been around for decades. Um, so age doesn't matter unless you're a cheese. I don't know about you, but I was like definitely early 40s by the time I realized that was not true. Um, and it just gets more not true. Uh, then there's old age is always 15 years older than I am. This is maybe the truest of them all, right? Um, we heard her earlier about the third age, oh, I'm still functional, I'm not like those people. And we actually see a lot of discrimination by people who are functioning well against older people who are functioning less well in continuing care retirement communities. And it's that sort of projecting our fear, but simultaneously creating a situation where when we get there, our life isn't going to be as we would hope it to be. So I think that one is funny and also tragic. Um, then there's how not to become a crotchety old man. And I always think like maybe you treat him like a human being still, or maybe you treat his pain. Um, and how not to become a little old lady. The only way not to become a little old lady is to die young, because we all shrink. It's just what happens. So it's probably a good idea if you're a lady to become an old lady and small. Um, in medical research, we see this same sort of denial. Um, the early research studies, the studies that are giving us this longevity, like incredible work in the middle of the last century, um, were basically done with mostly youngish, healthish, white, heterosexual males. 
Um, and they, they excluded other people because they said, particularly, when they mostly discussed females versus males. And they're like, well, females have these hormone things, and that messes with our data. So we're just going to exclude them. So they got these results, and the results have been helpful, right? But then they apply them to the females, and they get different outcomes. So like, oh, it's because they're different. So you can see this sort of circular logic. Um, anyway, so in the 80s, they said, look, if you're going to apply a treatment or a medication to people, you need to include them in the studies if they are female or from a minority group, so-called minority group. Um, now, that hasn't gone perfectly, but it did lead to some improvements. And in the 90s, they discovered that if you actually give the same treatment to like a four-year-old that you give to a 44-year-old, it doesn't go well for the four-year-old um, because they're different. They're much smaller, for starters. Um, so, so they included um, children. Any guesses as to when they included older people, the people who disproportionately most need health care in, in research mandates? Well, it's better than never, actually. It was 2019. Um, yeah. So decades of complaining about older people requiring medical care, but they don't include them. And this is fairly typical. But they are paying attention. And it actually did help somewhat in COVID. Um, this is Boston's anti-ageism campaign. Um, and a couple of things. It's good to think about how we talk about aging, because it really makes a difference in what services are available, how we feel about ourselves and other people. Um, so here we have this stunning person who, at 86, is better looking than I was at 20. But you know, life has diversity in various ways, and so she's gorgeous. Um, so she says she's a lot of things, but she's not over the hill. But she's been over the hill for decades, right? Like, I mean, if life is a, a curve, then she's been over the hill for decades. And, and so on the one hand, we're saying she's not over the hill. That's sort of being metaphoric. Like, she's not out of it. She's, she's still with it. There's a problem with that in two ways. One is that it means that when she's not so with it, right, then she counts less, whereas now she still counts. Um, we, we have to stop discounting our future selves because it really doesn't help anybody. Um, and, and also, wouldn't we rather live in a world where we understood that we're over the hill for half our lives? And that that's actually a pretty good place to be, right? I mean, there are people I meet who would want to be 16 again, but I don't know. I'm not among them. <laughs> um, this guy, he says he's not frail. Same thing. But when I look at him with a doctor's eye, I don't know what Heather's thinking, he's not so far off, you know? I mean, there's some stuff going on there we could see. Um, so. So are we saying that when he is frail in two years, then we, we don't, he doesn't count as much? I, I don't like that approach. Um, the language we use. So this is all medical journals now say this. Words like aged, elder, elderly, and senior should not be used because they connote discrimination and certain negative stereotypes. That's true. Now, have you ever seen somebody say, um, we should not be using words like infant, toddler, tween, or teen, because they denote discrimination? All these words mean is, is how long a person has lived. And yet, this is the organization that is supposed to be in charge of care for older people. Like, so instead of fighting the problem, they're sort of bowing to it. And that's because we all do it, right? It is normal and natural. We imprint on ourselves as young. So it's not a fault if we're all built that way. It's about trying to be and do better. Um, so I'm from near Silicon Valley. And it is a multi-billion, it might even be to trillions. I don't know how you judge a billion from a trillion. But um, trillions of dollars going to have people live forever or live longer or be healthier longer. But you're probably going to have to have at least millions and maybe billions to access this. And meanwhile, we have a world in which certainly those of us who are female, um, and some of the guys are going to end up like that. right? Imagine if we spent the same amount of money on improving current lives instead of creating things that will allow a tiny minority to live longer, especially on a planet that doesn't have enough resources. Then there's health systems. So I, I like to pick on my own institution. It's far better. Like, if you want to be invited anywhere, I just find it's a better thing. Um, so this is one of UCSF's big adult hospitals. We actually have several now. 
Um, and up there is one of our new children's hospitals. And then the thing you see up there that says what matters, medication, mentation, is something called the 4Ms framework or um, age-friendly health system. So notice how we get campuses and buildings. These are full of specialists for all your parts and all your needs. And then what do you get if you're old? Well, you get this age-friendly health system. It's actually pretty easy to get that designation. There's not a there there. Um, and if you actually showed it proportionally, it might look like this. You might be able to see that little dot. And that's only because I made it bigger than it should have been. Um, this is Ursula Le Guin, who died a little before the pandemic, um, a writer and activist who did some pretty great things. And she said, to tell me my old age doesn't exist is to tell me I don't exist. And when we don't stand up for old in all its variety and own it, then it looks to health systems or other systems like people aren't old. You know, like you're only old in that small period of frailty before you die, which actually isn't true. And yet, that's how public health takes it. So these are the um, vaccine schedules. Again, don't worry about the details. Basically, notice that this is for kids. There are 17 subcategories. How do we decide who needs what vaccinations? Well, it depends a bit on your immune system, on your physiology, and on your social behaviors. So it makes sense. Kids change a lot, right? So there's 17 different categories. Um, and then for adults, you'll see there are four categories. Um, <laughs> there's this thing called 65 and up. Now, my oldest patient so far was 111. That's an outlier, but there are a lot of people in their hundreds. So a 65-year-old and, let's say, a 103-year-old, no difference immunologically, physiologically, socially, no difference. So literally, there are these basic principles that everybody agrees upon, but everybody has this silent agreement to not apply them to old age. And yet they say it's evidence-based medicine or public health. What it is is prejudice, which brings me to ageism, one of my favorite topics. Um, this is Bob Butler, who founded the National Institutes on Aging, the first department of um, geriatrics. And he defined ageism, actually. In, the, in 1975, his book actually did win the Pulitzer, because four boy doctors have won the Pulitzer. <laughs> I tried. Somebody else has to do it, maybe you. OK. Um, a process of systematic stereotyping or discrimination against people because they are old, just as racism and sexism accomplish with skin color and gender. Now, first, let me say that it is not a competition for isms. And some people hold many isms in their lives, right? And that just makes things harder. Um, the other thing is, is this isn't quite right um, because of their age, because there is ageism against young people, too. In fact, there are some statistics that show that if you are a black woman, you're considered too young until you're 35 and too old once you're 40. That gives you a five-year window. I mean, we just walk around shooting ourselves in the feet here. It's craziness. Anyway, so, so there is discrimination on both ends. Um, he also says something that I think is maybe more apt, but ageism allows the younger generations to see older people as different than themselves, thus they subtly cease to identify with their elders as human beings. And you can see this in old age too, the more functional versus the less functional. Although again, I thought about making some, yeah, these changes. You know, it allows younger and healthier people to see older and frail people as different. So we other people to our own uh, losses, really, as we get older. Um, this is from AARP. You know, people are too old, too young to do various things. Not necessarily, right? It's about whether you can do it or not. You, can, you know, if you can run an online business, how can you be too old? You either can run an online business or you can't. Um, too young to run an online business. It's just, it's a problem for everybody. Um, ageism affects us in lots of ways. It's how we think how we feel, including about ourselves, um, and uh, how we act, right? It's, it's everywhere. <laughs> this was in the New York subway. Uh, it, it's a, it was a company that delivered food. So it basically said, when you want a whole cake to yourself because you're turning 30, which is basically 50, which is basically dead. <laughs> now, on a positive, people made so much noise that they took it down. But you know, if you live in a world where somebody thinks this is a good idea, I mean, they probably paid millions for this, right? 
So is it any wonder that people have trouble growing older? Um, ageism is everywhere, and there are three main kinds. So institutional or structural, I showed you some of that in the healthcare system. Interpersonal, where somebody doesn't notice you maybe. You know, now I, because of the book, I let my hair be gray, and it is very interesting the things that happen to you when you have gray hair, like all that stuff, it's real. Um, <laughs> it's very hard to soldier on, but one must. Um, and then they're self-directed. Uh, so institutions, relationships, and ourselves. There are things like this. What channel is the Netflix? <laughs> it's funny, right? I mean, and you have to have a sense of humor. But we also have to realize this doesn't have anything to do with her age. This has to do with her generation. And we can't conflate generational experiences with age. There was not a Netflix, right? Um, and then also, I really feel for this because I, I can't do anything without my glasses, but she can't even see it, right? What is with this small print? I was trying, I was somewhere the other day trying to order lunch and I'm like, I couldn't do it. And then a young person did the same thing and I was like, yes. <laughs> um, so one in two people worldwide are ageist against older people. Um, this is part of an international campaign. This is such a big deal across societies. Um, it takes an economic toll. I mean, think about how they say, like, old people should retire, they should move aside, and, and let younger people work. And then they say, older people are such a burden, they don't work anymore. <laughs> um, it exacerbates other disadvantages, right? So, so sometimes people, especially people of privilege, might focus on the ageism, but they don't think about how it's all connected. It's all connected. And we do better for all if we do better for each one of these. Um, and it affects us throughout life, um, which basically I've been saying. These are real people, so this guy was called a waste of time. I mean, does he even look old to you? I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, um, passed over for being near retirement, treated like I was senile, because she doesn't dye her hair either. So, so it's a problem. Um, I'm going to show you why this matters so much. I spoke earlier about um, deaths in pandemic and how some of this was really, a huge percentage of it was structural ageism in what we chose to do or not do. Um, this was a Time Magazine uh, article, The Road to Recovery, How Targeted Lockdowns for Seniors Can Help the U.S. Reopen. So I also think that U.S. is like us, right? So there's us and then there's seniors. Like, like seniors aren't even people, right? There's us, we go to work, and then we'll just lock them up, and then they'll be safe, and we won't worry about them. Um, this is somebody who has a blue, this was from Twitter. She has a blue check mark, which means, well, it's actually all changed, but we're not going to go into Musk. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway, so she had tons of followers, you know, a recognized person, and she sort of says, you can call me a grandma killer. I'm not sacrificing my home, food on the table. Like, I'm not giving up my life for those old people. But I, you probably can't see. It's very small. But there's a picture of her holding her child. So she is what my geriatrician colleague Joanne Lynn calls a grandmother in training. Right? So she, she's basically saying, like, I matter now and it will matter in the future, and my mother doesn't matter, my grandmother. Anyway, it, we just, it, it's okay to say these things. And can you imagine somebody saying, call me a child killer? Um, is age discrimination ac acceptable? Um, this was from a guy who's won every award as an ethicist, and you'll be happy to hear that he found very few situations in which it was. When I first saw this, my heart sank, but luckily it's okay. You can Google it. Um, Nursing homes don't have to report pre-May COVID-19 deaths to U.S. officials. So the federal government literally said, we don't have to count these deaths. So you are a citizen of the United States. You've lived your whole life, and your life literally isn't counted. Your death literally wasn't counted. Some colleagues at Harvard went back, and they found 64,000 cases and 16,000 deaths. Those were just the ones they could find records of that the federal government didn't care about. Can you imagine if they hadn't been old, if anybody... Like, it just wouldn't happen. Um, this is an article in New York Magazine. Uh, and, and this author sort of talked about the history of ageism. Um, but she also talked about how in the very first wave of the pandemic, the governors, particularly those of New York and New Jersey, who are now in the middle of large lawsuits, um, calculated the risks in front of them, the risks being like, wow, we don't have enough hospital beds. And what had happened with older people is that older people who'd been community living 
who'd been, like, I have a sort of distant relative who was a professor at Columbia, but he was in his 70s. People like that got sick, and they didn't get better as quickly. Because it's not like the physiology of old age doesn't matter, right? We know that. So they sent them to nursing homes. Now, they sent them to nursing homes when they had COVID, when the nursing homes were not provided with PPE or the ability to test, and when, as you'll see in a minute, they had no ability to keep other people safe, and that was what led to the outbreaks in nursing homes. They literally sent people from hospitals there um, to relieve local hospitals. And as this author concluded, it sacrificed the elderly and disabled to disease, not only the ones who were sent to lesser facilities, but the ones who were sent to, um, you know, to give COVID to everyone else. And who does this happen to differentially? You know, like if my mother had been in that situation, I would have figured out a way to bring her home because I have those resources of various kinds. So it was more poor people. It was more people of color. It was more people who hadn't been able to accrue over a lifetime, you know, what my color skin gives me. Um, so that led to huge deaths. Um, and this was the striking racial divide in how COVID-19 hit nursing homes, a consequence of policies. Um, one can say that the COVID response had these nine parts, you know, public information, disease presentation. I won't go into all of it. Um, older people were prioritized for one, even though we knew they were at highest risk before the first case happened in the U.S., right? We saw they were at highest risk in China, in Spain, everywhere where the virus was. Um, this was the CDC's main site giving public information. So it tells you all sorts of things. You'll see right here, it says children and teens. So they are calling out age-based risk. For children and teens, there's a pull-down menu of nine items, um, which is pretty amazing. But what about the people at highest risk? This was at a point where nobody was dying, right, that was a kid practically. And I'm not saying it's good that kids die. Like, I'm not saying that at all. Um, but very few children died. They were affected in other ways, and some of those other ways are addressed, as it should be by a public health system. But what about the people at highest risk? What about the people who, when this was up, were 70 to 80% of deaths, even though older people are 16% of the population? Nothing for them. They were under something called people at increased risk. And even when this was redone in 2022, it was alongside people who were pregnant, and then they sort of divided old people, adult day service centers, you know, caregivers of people with dementia. They don't treat old age in the same way they treat childhood and adulthood. Um, and that was part of why I called the book Elderhood, because it needs to be a whole phase of life with all kinds of distinctions in it, and it's not asking for anything special. It's just saying what you already do for childhood and adulthood, apply that to elderhood too, please. Um, other problems with prejudice is that they affect some people more. So this is the distribution by gender of people um, who live in nursing homes, um, mo more, uh, yeah, more females than males. Um, and then the workers, 90% females, right? So when nursing homes were really, really unwell uh, with COVID everywhere and no supports, it was mostly females and then females who went back to communities and brought the virus with them. Um, this is a law professor who talked about how the federal government suspended inspections and suspended training, right? So unprecedented pandemic, they stop training in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. They stop inspections. So the people who do not make a living wage have to go in there and work, and there's no training, there's no protective equipment. Um, th these were policy decisions that were national, local, statewide, and killed people. Um, Okay, so disease presentations. This is just to tell you there's four million articles and they, I had heard about this before I saw my first patient with COVID. So I think it was November, uh, no, it was March of um, 2020. People from Italy were saying, hey, we're seeing older people presenting differently with COVID. Then there started to be articles within months. So there was an evidence base. And saying that people present differently, which is not a surprise because people have different symptoms as they get older. Right, you get a bladder infection, maybe you fall down if you have bad arthritis. Um, you know, you have a heart attack, maybe you're just a little sleepy. People present differently as they get older. It wasn't new, it should have been expected. And in some of these studies, it was like 40% of older people. 
But what happened nationally and including at my place? They only had algorithms for adults and kids. In fact, they had kids' algorithms they kept updating at a point where in the US there were 5,000 child deaths. Now, no child death is a good thing, obviously. And something like 500,000 deaths of elders, but no algorithm, even though there was evidence with which to build it. That is blatant discrimination. Um, and it, it hits some people harder. So this was a study looking at, you know, if, if somebody has dementia and they get sick, they often get more confused. I know with my father, we had to be with him 24 seven and it was the only way he would not hurt others or himself um, and the only way to guarantee he had good care. Now in COVID, they weren't letting people in. Oh, except for they were letting some people in. If your kid was sick, if you were having a baby. But even though we knew some people needed a support with them, they weren't letting that happen. Um, except for some people, people like me, for example, could probably talk their way in. But if you didn't speak English, you probably couldn't do that. Or if you weren't used to talking to doctors in a certain way, you probably couldn't do that. Um, then we see in research how older people were excluded from a lot of the trials. So the vaccines, this is actually fascinating. The vaccines, um, most of the studies, almost all of them really, the upper age limit was 75 in the studies. Now why do we do studies? Why did it take so long to get vaccines for kids? Because we wanted to show two things. One, that they worked, and two, that they were safe. So we didn't prove that for older people. Now who did we give those vaccines to first? People in nursing homes, the one group where we hadn't proved efficacy and we hadn't proved safety. Now, that went as well as anything can go, but that was dumb luck. That was not good policy. Um, no visitors, I sort of just spoke to this. Um, you know, some people get visitors, there's this epidemic of loneliness and isolation, so by all means, let's tell older people they're at highest risk, they should never leave their house, and when they're sick in the hospital, let's have them be alone too. Insane. Um, but, but then we did do one thing right, right? Gave people the vaccines. Um, so, so this is actually showing that uh, nursing home residents are in red. They get the vaccines and suddenly they stop dying and the rates of other people dying. So when you prioritize the people at highest risk, the one time they prioritize them, they did much better. They did better than other people. Imagine if we had done that from the start. That's ageism. Um, and this sort of shows the same thing, that my group goes into the higher risk. It just works to prioritize people at highest risk. Um, this is from NPR more recently, um, and it's a guy called Greg Gonzalez, who's at uh, an epidemiologist at Yale. And he talked about pandemic, you know, sort of uh, COVID versus AIDS. Uh, and he, he said, one, you know, that there's one crucial public health less, lesson the country seems not to have learned. And he sort of talked about with HIV AIDS, um, you know, it, it was thought of as a disease of disposable people, right? In that case, Haitians, gay men, et cetera. And something similar happened to a lesser degree, but to the very same degree with COVID. And that did not go well for the country, just as HIV epidemic didn't go well. When we say certain people are at fault or certain people don't matter, it hurts all of us every time. Um, the Ontario Human Rights Campaign does some really good stuff about ageism. And they have said that from a human rights perspective, there's a lack of a sense of moral opprobrium linked to age discrimination, which in comparable circumstances would generate outrage if the grounds of discrimination were, say, rage, sex, or disability. Now, on the one hand, you can kind of argue that based on society, or at least in certain parts of it. Um, and on the other hand, it is an area where people seem to agree about old age. Um, it's also an area where people who are in it tend not to stand up for themselves, unlike other groups who self-define and advocate for their worth. Um, and the problem with not doing that um, brings up this quote from James Baldwin, people who treat other people as less than human must not be surprised when the bread they have cast on the waters comes floating back to them poisoned, right? So when we push away the people in the fourth age, the people with their advanced dementia or frailty, we create our own nightmare, you know, for our future selves. How do we think about that? Like, how do we, at the same time, like, nobody wants to be in that situation. That's a normal human response, and it is hard to look at. 
But how do we see that and make it better while still feeling those feelings so that when we get there, so that it's better for the people who are there now, and when we get there, it's better for us. There can be a self-interest and, and, and a, a social advantage simultaneously. OK, now I'm going to get more cheerful, I promise. We're going to talk about the future. Um, these are things that we can all do to make aging better, um, starting with this. So hopefully I've already convinced you of this, but what if the greatest limitation of aging came from our imaginations and policies and not our physiology? It's not that the physiology doesn't matter. I, you can tell I'm old enough, I know. Like I walk down the hallway and the noise of my joints, it's like I'm, I'm like a whole jukebox. Um, so, so yeah, it does matter, but so much is more than that and those are the things we can control better. Um, and what can we as individuals do as we add more candles to our birthday cake? Um, part of it is the language we use. You know, it, it's about using we instead of them. You know, it's about saying I'm old. It's really interesting. Well, partly because I, I deal with medical students, so they're in their early 20s, so they probably can't tell the difference between me and my mother um, because we both have gray hair and we look kind of similar. But my mother is 30 years older. Um, so. So I say I'm old, and they always then say, oh, no, you're not. And I'm like, well, I am, but there's nothing wrong with it, right? I'm actually very happy. Like, you're the one all stressed out about your, step, your shelf exam, right? I'm, I'm actually having a good day. Um, so we have to normalize those things, and we have to say we as aging people, we as an aging society, um, not them. Um, we as people with frailty, really paying attention to how we speak. Um, can, can help a lot. Um, it turns out ageism is really bad for you. We talked earlier about internalized ageism, and this is a lot of work from Becca Levy at Yale, who for 30 years has looked into how ageism affects health. On this graph here, again, you can close your eyes if you don't like graphs. Um, people who have negative aging stereotypes, so think badly about old age, died seven and a half years earlier from heart attacks and strokes than people who had more positive attitudes. Now we think that happens in a couple of ways. Um, one is that if you think, you know, it's a done deal, there's nothing to be done, you might not eat right, you might not exercise, you might not get enough sleep, you might not do all the things that actually still keep helping you in your 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, although I do think that one should be able to eat more ice cream, but that's a different story. Um, maybe not every day though. Uh, you know, so, so there is this seven and a half year difference. You found other things. People with positive a a aging stereotypes are less likely to have Alzheimer's mic markers in their cerebrospinal fluid, right? So part of it is how you behave. The other thing may be the chronic stress. Because if you are old and you think being old is bad, that is, you know, a prejudice against the self. And that leads to stress. Stress leads to inflammation. Inflammation causes chronic disease and premature death. So do we know for sure those are the mechanisms? No, but it seems highly likely. So why aren't we dealing with this as a public health issue, as individuals and as a society? Um, healthy things, I sort of just mentioned this, but healthy lifestyles make a difference. This was actually a recent article um, that people live longer and they develop less dementia. When people are asked what scares them most, the top two are cancer and dementia. Many cancers are also avoided by eating the right diet. So there are things we can do, but you know, we have a health system where it's gonna pay to give you a transplant, but it's not actually gonna pay to make sure you have access to healthy food or to a gym, right? That's about how we vote. That's about how we pressure people um, to enable us to be healthy. The healthcare system is set up so that the sicker you are, the better it is for them. They make more money, they are happier. They want you in the intensive care unit. If you're not there, they want you in the hospital. And if you're not there, I guess it's okay that you're in the clinic, but they, you know, that's kind of a pain for them too. They would much rather have you in the hospital. That's what they're paid for. So we need to stand up for what we want, which is not to need the intensive care unit or the hospital and to only need the clinic periodically. And there are ways of doing that, but we have to make all these things possible, all these areas of wellness, which do not change over the lifespan. How they look changes and how they look varies depending on who we are, but they don't change. Um, we need to tell the truth about happiness. So these are international curves showing that people are happier 
in late life and early life, right? It's kind of like a smiley face. Now, if you're in, an, uh, in a country with very less income, you're less happy and more happy is lower than it is if you're you know, in a better situation. So, but that just makes this seem more true. Um, and this has been shown over and over again. So why don't we talk about the happiness? Now, is everybody who's really old happy? No. And, and might this be biased by the fact that if you're incredibly sick or in constant pain, you might not pick up the phone for a surveyor? Yes. But they've done it enough times that there is something about people being satisfied with who they are and making better decisions about how they're going to spend their time. Right? I only had, there's this ticking clock, right? So I'm not going to waste my time doing that stuff. I'm going to do this thing that matters to me more. And celebrating that and enjoying that is so important. Um, Recognizing that, you know, people always talk about you want to stay independent, and you do. Except for we're all interdependent, and also we're all going to get to a point of even greater interdependence. If we acknowledge that, if we work on setting up social networks that are new and growing, if you make it to your 80s, the chances are a lot of important people in your life will be dead. And a friend that you've had for two years or five years is better than no friend at all. We know that. It's not the same as your sister. It's not the same as the person you were married to for 50 years. But it is far better than nothing. Um, we also see, we were discussing this at lunch, that people don't want to make their homes age friendly. And consequently, they get sent to nursing homes, even when they don't have medical needs. And that's because they can't function in their home. And part of that is because of ageism, right? Because we have cute, colorful things for kids. We have a million things for adults. And we have had traditionally mostly ugly things for aging in place. But it is getting much better. And the more people demand it and set up, if you're 50 or older, I tell people, when you redo your house, you make it age friendly. And it's actually good to do, too, because when your pregnant daughter-in-law comes to visit, she's going to have an easier time getting in and out of the bathtub. And when the grandson breaks his leg, he's going to have an easier time. It's actually better for everyone. Um, you need a reason to get up in the morning, and it doesn't matter what age you are. Now, there's some school kids who would rather not get up to go to school, but you know, um, they might get up to play some games. But, but you need to think, what is that thing for you? And it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's big or small or personal or public. Um, but if you don't have that, your health is worse. And more importantly, the quality of your life is worse. And we don't talk en enough about purpose. Um, there's some evidence that men die disproportionately after retiring, because more of their social life and purpose is tied up in their jobs. So I now speak to men in their 60s talking about what is it we need to start planning now. And you need to think of why you're going to get up in the morning and how you're going to spend your time. And is that going to need to change again? It is. As we move through life, we need to change what we can do. Um, that's true at all ages, but somehow it seems awful in older ages. And partly, it's because you acquire these things you didn't really want. <laughs> you know, there are these problems. It's, it's real. Um, but I heard a great story um, from a journalist a few years ago about he moved in as a, as a sort of young family man um, and saw this old guy, he says, you know, jogging by every morning. Old guy would be gone for like an hour to jog back. So then his kids are in their teens. The old guy starts coming by on a bicycle. Gone for about an hour, comes back on his bicycle. His kids have grown up and it's left, and his, he and his wife are thinking of selling the house. Old guy comes by walking, gone for an hour, comes back walking, right? So one imagines that was the guy in his 70s, in his 80s, in his 90s. What he did changed, but the fact that he got up and exercised, he had time alone, he had time in nature, he adapted, and consequently, there's a lot of evidence that that was a big part of why he lived into his 90s as a happy guy. Um, so yes, you can't do it the same way, but should you do it anyway? Now, I say this having spent last weekend with my mother who needs a walker. And I was like, well, wouldn't it be better to use this than not to go out? And she's like, I'll need to think about that. And I'm like, oh, you're killing me. <laughs> so I do understand that it is a hard sell sometimes. Um, but, but you know, it, 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 is, it is a choice. Um, we need to think about justice for everyone. There is a lot, especially where I am, about doing things that are going to further advantage the advantaged and not necessarily help everyone. And I like this, because inequality, these two kids are looking for an apple, right? So the tree is tilted toward the kid on the left, and there's more apples on his side. So that's inequality. 
Then equality is they both get a ladder, right? So it's equal. We're going to give you each a ladder. But because the tree is tilted, it doesn't help the poor kid on the right who still doesn't get an apple. Um, then we look at equity, which is we give the kid on the right a taller ladder so he can actually reach part of the tree and get himself an apple. Um, and then there's justice, where you actually try and make the tree not tilt towards the one kid, because that's not fair. Um, and then this is my favorite part of all, which um, comes from Tony Ruth. Does the kid even want an apple? Maybe he doesn't like apples, right? <laughs> so we need to be thinking about this in everything we do. Um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. They're age-friendly cities. But that means you need to show up when your city or town is doing something, and you need to say, that sounds like a nice transportation system for people going to work or going to school, but that's actually not going to help me because the first step to get onto that bus is not going to work for me and people like me. Um, you need to stand up. You need to say, I'm old, and here's what I need. And it's just as legitimate of what, as what other people need. But you also need to support what those other people need if you want them to support what you need. Um, this is the World Health Organization's What's Needed for Healthy Aging, and I won't go into it in huge detail, but I do like that healthy aging is being able to do the things we value for as long as possible. Right? That may mean aging in place. It may mean being independent. It may mean you know, there, that you're missing a lot of people from your family and you move into an assisted living place and you make all these new friends um, and you start doing new things. There are so many ways to have this happen. It depends on who you are and what your options are. Um, but it sort of starts with a change in the way we think about aging and old people. Um, I'm going to close up now. I'm probably gone too long. Sorry, I get enthusiastic and it takes a long time. Um, if you Google the lifespan, you will see this. So we have infant toddler, tween, sort of teen, young adult. And then I figure I'm about here. Got the glasses, got the COVID hips. And then there's this. That's a little confusing, isn't it? Do we feel like something's missing? Am I the only one who thinks something's missing? Um, yeah. And, and also, you can be in a wheelchair when you're four, right? And you can be 95 and not be in a wheelchair. Um, are your chances, do your chances go up? Yes, but we don't even have a language for these stages. So how are we going to get policies or a healthcare system that pays attention when we don't have words for that? We need words for these stages, just as we already have words for the preceding stages. Um, I'm hoping all of you will become troublemakers. Uh, this is from uh, Lovey Ajayi Jones. Um, a professional troublemaker is someone who is committed to being authentically themselves while speaking the truth and doing some scary shit. <laughs> it may be scary to say, I am old and I have this need. But do it, because the only way you get the need met is to be a troublemaker. Um, <laughs> this is my institution. So we're in San Francisco. We think of ourselves as very liberal. So we welcome all races, religions, countries of origin, sexual orientations, genders, ethnicities, and abilities, but not all ages, um, which I sometimes joke is because we're being honest about our health system, which doesn't do a good job for old people. Um, I would like to see a world like this, where we have some equity and justice across these age groups. Um, and I think I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> it's too much. I've gone too long. Um, one of the ways you can do all this is Ollie at Duke, and think about how the programming or how you can, you can harness the incredible energy and opportunities here. I mean, this is an incredibly strong Ollie. I have spoken at a bunch of them. Um, what could you do that would make this community a model for the rest of us? Because you seem to have a lot of resources not everybody has, and now is the moment. We are the generations who get to define what happens next, and there is a lot of opportunity there. Um, and with that, I will stop. And thank you for your attention. Wow. Isn't she a superstar? Isn't she a superstar? Really. Thank you to our Durham and Duke guest, 
our Ali community, Dr. Aronson, for being with us today to celebrate at long last our 45th anniversary for Ali at Duke. Dr. Aronson, I want to personally thank you, sorry, for the manner in which you have chosen to care for your patients, for members of your family, and by virtue of having written your book, the millions of others who have been called upon to care for loved ones. Please know that I have seen myself many times in the pages of your wonderful book. Now, with the guidance of your book, I and others must decide what we want our elder plans to be. Thank you for providing us with such clear guidelines. And thanks to your book, your mother has become my role model. Thank you for sharing that wonderful, resilient woman with us. <laughs> On a personal note, delivering these closing remarks are one of my last acts as Ali president. So here are a few thoughts gathered from Ollie's leadership team. My question to them was, what makes Ollie special to you? Ben Edwards shared that Ollie has given him the opportunity to develop nourishing relationships with remarkable people. Bobby Hendricks, our president-elect, said that Ali feeds her passion as her passion to learn, and as she continues to learn and grow, it changes what she thought she knew. Lisa Gabriel shared that initially she came to Ali for lifelong learning then found community and made amazing friendships and has had life-changing experiences that she really didn't expect. Beth Anderson shared that being on the curriculum committee has on a daily basis given her life a valuable home that has been both enriching and inspiring. Sue Dennison says that all, for her, Ollie at Duke helps us stay young, vibrant, and vital. Ted Siegel explained that what makes Ollie special to him is it's expanding its reach on Zoom and DEI initiatives. And for him personally, it's given him exposure to great classes, classes instructors, and people. Donna West, who is one of our newest board members, said that Ali at Duke means connection to her alma mater, its programs, a community of diverse, thoughtful, intelligent, caring people, challenge to her and challenge to her to broaden her horizons 
her knowledge and perspectives. Connection, community, a challenge. And finally, Diane Huntley shared that for her, Ollie celebrates and teaches the art of living well. So, as we proceed to the reception, let's continue this program that teaches us the art of aging well. Here's to another 45 years at Duke, Ali at Duke. Thank you for being here in person and those of you online. Again, a very special thanks to Dr. Aronson for her words of wisdom on redefining aging and embracing elderhood. Thank you.